Okay, hi everyone. This is so great. I'm gonna lift this up a little bit. For those who don't know me, my name is Margaret Mueller. I'm the president and CEO of the Executives Club of Chicago. Welcome to our inaugural event of the next season. It is sold out, which is probably more a testament to our speaker than the pandemic, but I'm also really encouraged that people are back. It's really exciting as an organization that serves the business community. It's so great to have this room so full of Chicago business leaders. So we're so glad you're here. I also want to give a shout out to my friend Tara Montgomery. You may have noticed there's a change in moderator in the program. The original moderator got stuck because of weather. Um, Tara answered the call. You are in for a treat because she is a total pro. And today is her birthday and we're making her work on her birthday. So I just want to say happy birthday to Tara. Um, you'll learn a little bit more about her in just a minute. So just on to a bit of housekeeping. housekeeping. First, Programs such as today's are only made possible by all of our generous sponsors of the Executives Club of Chicago. Thank you all. I think they're showing on the screen. We could not do any of this without you. They're the ones that help us deliver this to the business community, and we're very grateful. Sec oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Second, I'd like to acknowledge the members of the Board of Directors and our Council of Advisors that are in the room with us today. We have Teresa Harmon um, from Sidley. We have David Gupta from SDI Presence. We have Liz Conley from CDW. I think um, she is in the back. Um, and we have Suzette McKinney from Sterling Bay. Thank you all for being here. Uh, the next thing. <laughs> uh, submit questions to Janet and Tara. I know they're going to try to get to as much as they possibly can. You text EXEC, E-X-E-C, to the number 22333. You'll get a prompt and then you can submit their question. They'll pop up here. I know she's going to do her absolute best. And you're also going to find a QR code printed on the program at your seat that code, we're not doing big paper programs anymore. So that um, code will get you the instructions for texting questions, more information about today's program, and other information about what's happening at Exec Club. So now, I'd like to introduce Kathy Scherer. She's the Central Region Market Partner and Chicago Managing Partner at Deloitte. Deloitte has been a very generous supporter of Exec Club for many, many years. We are really grateful for their leadership and their commitment to the Chicago business community. Welcome, Kathy. Hello, everyone. It is, oh, Margaret's a little taller than me. <laughs> Just that microphone. It's wonderful to be here with you today and to be introducing this conversation with Janet Foudy. Uh, and I'd like to now start by welcoming our moderator, and she is an Emmy Award winning producer. Her name is Tara Montgomery, and she is the executive producer and content creator for OWN. Does anyone know what that stands for? Oprah Winfrey Network, woohoo! So she oversees all air branded content for Oprah Winfrey, including primetime interviews, own spotlights, super soul, and live events. This is very impressive. Most recently, she produced CBS's Adele One Night Only performance, an interview with Oprah, and it garnered over 10 million viewers. So we are very, very lucky to have her here today with us. She's a fellow Chicagoan, and she serves on the bright pink board with Janet. So let me get to Janet. Janet is our executive chair of the board of Deloitte US, and she's the co-author of Arrive and Thrive, Seven Impactful Practices for Women Navigating Leadership. She wrote this book in collaboration with Simmons University leaders, Susan McKenty Brady and Dr. Lynn Perry Wooten. Arrive and Thrive offers meaningful support to women in leadership positions. So today, Janet's going to share her experiences about her career and uh, some of the things that inspired this book. And she's going to highlight practices. The book actually has um, some very practical things that we can do as leaders to thrive in our own careers, men and women. And she's going to share some insights and stories uh, that were actually contributed by other very impressive business leaders. 
Um, and I just wanted to, before I turn the stage over to the two of them, um, really just personally attest to the fact that Janet is just an amazing leader. During the fa past five years, she's really evolved uh, from uh, having the role of our Deloitte Consulting CEO. And as I said, she currently serves as our US board chair. And she moved to actually co-author this very impactful and very practical book to help female executives thrive. So she's covered a lot of ground. Uh, she's smart, she's authentic, she's a, a very curious leader, a courageous leader, she's approachable, and she's a connector. And I'll just end with a story on how great of a networker and a connect, uh, connector Janet actually is. And it's funny, because she was talking to, about this story with Tara and me before, uh, before we all started this program today. So I was a young partner, Janet was a young partner, and I was out visiting with a prospective client. And I got back to the office, and this was the early 2000s, so we actually had phones on our desks that had little like screens on the phone. And I saw this name, Janet Foudy, popping up, and I thought, huh, that's unusual. The name of the client that I was just out visiting was Kent Foudy, huh. This is an odd connection. So I pick up the phone and it's Janet. And sure enough, uh, on my way back to the office, her husband Kent had called and said, Kathy Shearer was out visiting me today. And so Janet actually you know, was scoping me out and trying to find out a little bit more about me. But I, you know, I say that as it's a great story about Janet because she uh, carries through and does actions that a lot of us think about. Uh, but we don't, you know, we don't always uh, take the action to follow through, and uh, Janet really just does it. And uh, we made that connection in the early 2000s, you know, as a testament to Janet, and we have stayed friends and colleagues ever since. So without further ado, I would like to turn the stage over to Tara and to Janet, and it's going to be a wonderful conversation. So thank you. Thank you, and happy birthday. Well, that was quite the introduction. <laughs> I don't think there's a way to, to, to bridge gracefully from that, Tara. <laughs> Hi, everybody. This is so nice to see everybody. I'm so happy to be here with my friend, Margaret, who um, is a dear friend of mine. And um, Janet, if anybody has ever gotten a text from Janet and she said, can I talk to you for two seconds? I was like, yes, you can right away. <laughs> Um, and so I'm so happy that I was in town, and this is just an honor and a thrill for me. I'm usually behind the scenes. A lot of you are probably familiar with Oprah's work over the last um, quarter century or so is how long I've been working for her over on the west side of Chicago, which was just such a thrill and a joy, and now for the OWN Network and other platforms. Anyway, um, to Janet, um, also just wanted to thank you for inviting me. I've known Janet for a couple of years now. I know her family. And we've done a lot of uh, wonderful work together for Bright Pink, which is um, you know, a phenomenal organization that we're so proud and honored to serve on the board together. And I've met a lot of powerful women. I don't think you could name a powerful woman that I have not met or <laughs> interacted with or read their book or interviewed them or constructed the interview, produced the interview. And I just want everyone here to know, and I know um, Kathy was so nice to say those wonderful words. Janet um, has a warmth and a grace and a grounding um, that most powerful women do not have. Um, so to check all those boxes and then also just be just a wonderful friend, mother, um, and family member that, and wife and, and community member, on top of all the things that she does for Deloitte and women in business, it's really just an honor and a pleasure for me to do this today. So, well, thank you, and I'm really <laughs> looking forward to the conversation. I'm super grateful you're here. The last, and then we're going to stop the love yeah. fest part of this and get to content <laughs> because we yeah. can only take. We're both pretty practical, and we can only yes. take so much of this. Um, but the Adele special, if you happen to be watching the Emmys on Sunday, the Adele special was nominated for an Emmy, um, and so Tara Dang. will be there in all her beautiful glory. Um, and we have our fingers crossed that. Our very own Chicagoan will be on the Emmy stage um, on Sunday. Yes. Okay, so now we're done with the love so, fest yes. and down to work. Down yeah? to work. So um, thank you so much for writing this important and timely book. And uh, we both know that women are facing so many inequities and challenges and obstacles, especially women of color and women in uh, marginalized communities. 
and everything that has happened in the workforce, especially for women during the COVID-19 pandemic. I love this question because I always love to know why authors wrote a book. It's one of the first questions Oprah always asks too. So what inspired you? What was the inspiration and the key moments for you to write Arrive and Thrive? So I'll start by telling you that I did not have it in my grand life ambition whatsoever to be an author. This, if I had had a grand life plan, this would not have been in it. Um, but we do have an amazing long-standing relationship with Simmons University, which is a women's college in Boston. We, Deloitte, have a relationship with Simmons. And Simmons had an incoming president, um, um, Lynn Perry, Dr. Lynn Perry Wooten. Um, she's a very highly accomplished um, black woman academic and one of the very few black university presidents um, and was coming to this role. And frankly, our team said, you and Lynn, I think we get along really well. You should write a book. And I will tell you, we both were like, we got a lot going on. She's taking this new job. We're pretty busy. We didn't know we were about to enter a pandemic. And we're like, how many gazillion books have been written on women's leadership? A lot, right? A lot. Yeah. Tara's read them all. Yeah. And, but what we found as we started noodling on what could we do that would be interesting and different, we started thinking about what was really stopping women from accelerating in their careers. So just take simple stats out of school. It's basically 50-50 men and women in, in the business community at large. By the time you get to middle managers, women are about 25%. And the Fortune 500 CEOs is at a record record high right now at 8.8% for the US Fortune 500 and just below 5% for the global um, Fortune 500. So clearly something is amiss. And what we decided we wanted to focus on and where we thought there was a, a unique place for a conversation was around not how do you get there, but once you get there, how are you wildly successful and happy thrive. It's not about survival. It's about, I don't think the revival is a word, but it's about thriving. That was not a very graceful sentence. But so our whole idea is no matter what level of leadership, whether it's woman's first leadership job or moving between executive roles in an organization, what are the really grounded and practical practices and ideas? And how can you learn from other stories in terms of what it takes to really thrive in leadership? That was, that was the heart of the matter. Um, I think we landed on something pretty interesting because the level of engagement in the business community and people wanting to participate in the book, which I'll share a little bit with you later today, mm -hmm. um, has been high and it's been wonderful to be able to have conversations like this. Yeah, it's so interesting because while I was reading it, it resonated with me in so many ways because I think with women of a certain age who are coming up and you maybe did or you're lucky to have a mentor, but you know, you're so busy to take care of your home life and uh, you're, you're afraid to look vulnerable, you're afraid to look like you don't have it all together, you don't have the right clothes, you don't have the right, you know, what it takes to get, uh, you know, deal with the office environment, all those kinds of things. And that's what one of the things I will say just personally, what I loved reading about it. Um, there are seven key practices, thank you for not making it 10. Seven is, <laughs> is really good, anything under, under seven. I just wanna read them because I think they're really, um, important. Investing in your best self, embracing authenticity, cultivating courage, fostering resilience, inspiring a bold vision, creating a healthy team environment, and committing to the work of an inclusive leader. As you can see, it like builds up to first yourself, of course, like put your own oxygen mask on first, and then how are you going to build slowly up to how are you going to help everybody around you, which of course, that's what all of us women, sorry to the men, all of us women are doing <laughs> almost every single day. Um, so which of the seven practices do you find you follow most closely in your own life mm -hmm. and work? So I'm going to talk about two if I could, um, because you, you bridged already to authenticity. So I want to talk very briefly about authenticity and my own journey in authenticity. When I started my career and looking around the room, some of you probably were not born yet. Many of you were at least um, alive, but some of you probably not born yet. Authenticity was not in the conversation, 100%. It was about absolutely fitting in. Whether you, by the way, man, woman, gender, race, it was about absolutely matching the norm in the conversation. Now, I'm the daughter of a scientist and an artist, and I was absolutely clueless about what does that look like to fit into the environment. So I thought I was doing a pretty good job of adapting in and, and fitting in. As a daughter of a scientist and artist, I'm sure in retrospect, I was not whatsoever. 
But I reached a really pivotal point in my life and my career. I've been on the road. It's funny. I actually, I don't know if I said this in my introduction, but I live in Chicago. I live in Lakeview. I raised my kids in Evanston. Um, and I've done conversations like this all around the country. And Margaret and I were having coffee. And I'm like, I'd really like to spend some time in Chicago talking about things that are important to me since I actually live here and have a house and a dog and a husband who all live here. Where was I going with this? Oh, yeah, this pivotal moment. I'd been on the road. I'd been working in New York for most of my career. And I found I was pregnant with twins, not in the grand life plan, if I'd had one again. And I really was anxious about traveling with newborn twins. I was not sure my marriage would survive that. And I really wanted to be sort of home and in the moment with my kids. And I had no idea what I was doing, as most new moms don't. And so I had sold a project locally, a really small project. And what I wanted was that project to grow and become a foundation for me to be able to stay local and work here in Chicago for a number of years and begin to raise my family while advancing my career. And that is the moment where I began to truly understand what authenticity was about because there was no way I could keep sort of the traditional guardrails up of what I thought was the, well, I call it a 42 long with all due respect for the men in the audience who may or may not be 42 longs, but what a 42 long looked like. I invited my teams to my home to see the chaos and the mess with my kids. We had you know, two evenings a week where everyone left by five, um, and then two evenings a week where we stayed late because if we missed eight o'clock bedtime, it really didn't matter what time we got home. And so in that moment, I found that that authenticity was not only a much more comfortable way to work and live, but what I found was my teams excelled. They were brilliant. Um, and they did things that no one ever thought they could do. And I believe we now understand that being your authentic self, which is the language that we use today, made such a huge, huge, huge difference. The second practice I want to talk about is inspiring a bold vision. And I want to talk about this because I do believe in our society, in this country for sure, there is this idea that to be a visionary, you have to be the one that wakes up in the morning with the brilliant new idea that no one's ever thought of. And we really, I think, worship that idea of brilliance, of innovation and vision. And frankly, I never in a trillion years thought I could be sitting here because I didn't think I would ever be that visionary because I wasn't the person that woke up with a brilliant new idea that no one had ever thought of. And what I came to appreciate over the course of my career, that the things that um, women and many men are good at as well, even though you might not be the person with a new idea no one's thought of, the idea of listening really carefully, connecting the dots, looking for white space, doing all those things absolutely has helped propel me in a very different way. And I've started new businesses that no one had ever thought of. And I've transformed businesses not because I woke up with the brilliant idea, but because I was really good at helping create the environment to create the innovative net new ideas. So those are two of the practices that are near and dear to my heart um, that I wanted to just share a few quick tidbits about. That's amazing. So Janet, I just have to go back to you inviting your team to your house. Um, I was 29 working for the Oprah show, which was very, very intense. I'll never do anything that intense again. And um, my son was born, and it gave me the courage to say, put up some guardrails mm. about my work life and who I was working with, the projects I was working on, all those kinds of things. He's 23 years old and sitting here now. And uh, he's, the, he's the reason I had the courage to do that. And, and I try to tell young women on my team, you don't need to have an impending baby to have the courage to do that now. You know, this was a human life coming into our house and it was, it, it gave me the courage, but I hope all the women on my team and all the women on your teams have the courage to speak up and say what they need now too, um, which I think is um, really important to support. Um, I'm curious of which one um, of, of the seven practices pushed up or disrupted your own thinking the most? Ah, good question. Well, in the spirit of authenticity, I'm going to tell you it is like 150 degrees in here. Yeah. So I'm going to be brave <laughs> and I'm going to take my jacket off, which I never do, but this is the new me. Um, and my team is laughing because I'm always freezing. So I wonder if they told everyone to put the heat up in here. Um, so anyway, that feels much better. So thank you for allowing me the courage of showing my 50-something arms in front of all of you today. 
Um, so the, the practice that pushed me the most for sure, and you said it so eloquently um, when you talked about the practice, was actually investing in your best self. Mm -hmm. And my two co-authors were an academic that I talked about and a wonderful leadership coach um, named Susan Brady, and she pushed me very, very hard here. I will tell you, I was one of those women or people that thought, if you were spending a moment on introspection, you're wasting time. And for me, even breathing sometimes feels like you are not doing what you should be doing, which is one foot in front of the other and running a million miles an hour. Now, I will tell you that I am someone who is very disciplined about creating the space that give me for the things that give me energy. So I take some responsibility for this practice of investing in your best self. But I will tell you that for me, investing in my best self historically is not about the quiet moments, but was about creating the space for my family and health and fitness and my friends, which I've done probably episodically over the years, um, probably not as much investment as I would have liked. But what I've learned the most about from writing this book was about really creating the space for reflection um, more than just I know these two things that give me energy and, and I know I will focus on them, but really thinking about your strengths, thinking about um, how you create a world around you um, to give you um, even more energy than in the basics. And, it, and it's uncomfortable. I got asked on a podcast a couple weeks ago about meditation because when you co-author something, we did have editorial control um, over over the whole book, but I, there's some things that I was like, well, I'm not sure I would really write that, but but I'm all in. And there's a little bit on meditation. And I was like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna seem like <laughs> such. And a podcaster asked me about my meditation practices and I had to fully confess that they were negligible, but I'm still trying, sort of. <laughs> In the spirit of full authenticity, continuing. Yeah. So that that is um, Tara. What continues to push me the most? Um, I've had the privilege of being in lots of roles and doing lots of really interesting things, um, but I still find when I'm faced with a decision about um, a variety of things, I'm really trying to create more space for reflection. Mm -hmm. It's really important. Um, I'll just tell you the thing that hit me. You know, Oprah has used the phrase "your authentic self" for so long, and we, you know we encouraged women to do that but when I read that chapter I was like I've never thought about my own authentic self <laughs> I swear to God and uh, so it's was you know I, I love a book that like gives you a roadmap so thank you for that um, also um, there's so many um, practical like I was just saying practical guides and exercises the the storytelling in the book is also really really powerful and I'm curious what which particular story, if there was a leader or a personal story from some, some of the so many accomplished women that you talked to for the book that really resonated with you? So would you be okay if I read a little bit? Yeah, okay. I love it. Because um, I could tell my stories all day long. So um, the book is absolutely made up of, you guys can tell I'm pretty practical, very practical lists, checklists, frameworks, ideas, but there's also a lot of storytelling. And the three of us sat down and we said, well, we've had interesting lives, but We'd really love to expand the aperture of who contributes stories to this conversation. So I will tell you, I, I tried to actually think about how many emails I've written in my lifetime, and um, you know, it, it's clearly upwards of half a million emails. And there were 20 emails um, about a year ago that I sent that were probably the most nervous I've ever been before hitting send. Um, and I've sent emails to thousands of people to exec the whole nine yards, but these were the ones where I read it and reread it and reread it. And they were to the 20 executives that I opened up the proverbial Rolodex or contacts of executives that I wanted to ask if they would contribute to this conversation and participate in this book. And the idea of asking a personal favor made me uncomfortable because that wouldn't normally be in my, in my pedigree. And the idea of asking these executives to talk about women's leadership was a moment. And when I realized we were onto something is, by the way, I had an A list, a B list, a C list. <laughs> um, and I was like, okay, I'm not gonna like, I, I gotta have my defenses up here in case this doesn't, you know, I'm a defensive pessimist in case things don't go well. Um, and all 20 of them said yes. And 19 of the 20, actually we said, you can frankly have your chief of staff if they want write some notes for us or you can write them yourself or we can do a live interview and 19 of the 20 asked for a live interview um, and created the time and space to participate in this conversation. So since they were so gracious with their time. I think that says a lot about how people are feeling about this topic. Yes. So I want to read um, three sections to you um, that, that I think were probably the best stories um, for me of the many stories in the book. 
Um, so the first is from Carla Harris from Morgan Stanley, who is an incredible executive at Morgan Stanley, an amazing banker. She also happens to be like um, a very, very, very accomplished um, singer, and she does concerts all around New York. Um, she's incredible. So here's what she said. I was told by a senior leader that I was smart and worked hard, but that I wasn't tough enough for this business. My first reaction was, what is he smoking? You can call me a lot of things, but ain't tough ain't one of them. It was a wake up call that the real Carla was no longer walking into Morgan Stanley. I saw myself as tough. Somewhere along the way, I had lost my voice, swallowed my voice, lost my confidence, and that girl was not the one showing up every day and being as successful. I went out of my way to underscore my toughness until my persona caught up with the perception. I went out of my way to walk tough, eat tough, drink tough. That is who I am. Be that, so be that, Carla, good, bad, or ugly. By definition, your authenticity is your competitive advantage. I'm just going to underscore that again. By definition, your authenticity is your competitive advantage. Nobody can be the way you can be you. I can never out Janet Janet. There might be things that Janet does that I admire that I might want to have in my tool chest. That's good, but I must do it in my own way that is authentic to Carla. Don't try to be like Janet. So I love that. First of all, I'm a fangirl of this woman. I love that she used my name in her quote. <laughs> um, and so I have to say that, that, that felt really good. But I love the, a woman so successful and so clear in her vulnerability and sharing that moment with us I love. I'm going to read two quick other additional quotes. One is from, the next one's from Amy Weaver. Amy has had a really interesting career. She's a lawyer. She was the general counsel at Salesforce. She then got asked by Mark Benioff to be the CFO at Salesforce. That's not a path you normally see is moving from general counsel to CFO. And if you caught the press this week, she's just coming onto the McDonald's board. So she's going to be spending a lot of time here. We should figure out how to actually have her an event here. She's incredible. Here's what she said. I think the most powerful speech I ever gave in terms of impact to other people was with my whole global team about four years ago. I was expected to give this inspirational speech, and what I talked about instead for five minutes was three major failures in my life. One was I made a mistake that almost cost an IPO. I had to fix it and get past it. This is from when she was working for a law firm. Another was I was involved in a deal when everything went wrong. I had to get up every morning and sludge through it till it got done. Third, I had my hat in the ring for a board of directors seat for a significant foundation. I was so excited because it was a stretch. There were thousands of people I got down to number two and didn't get it. I was crushed. In talking to my teams about these mistakes, I emphasize that you fix them and get over it. Other people will make mistakes, help them get through. I love that. Other people will make mistakes, help them get through. You can do everything right and not get it at the end, and you're going to try again. You could feel the change in the room and the teams after that speech. Wow. And the last is from Albert Borla. Now, Albert Borla is now pretty much a household name as the CEO of Pfizer. He was the one I was the most nervous to hit send on because it was in the middle of vaccine development. And I thought, okay, there is, and, and he and I have a good positive relationship, but I'm like, okay, there's no way he's even responded to this email. And if he does, he's going to have someone else write this for him. But we had the opportunity to interview him in the middle of vaccine development. And here is what he said about vision. I truly believe that people don't actually know what they can and cannot do. As a leader myself, this is a constant theme. Usually you severely underestimate what can be done. When you're setting goals or visions, you tend to get something that is believable that others can come with you to achieve. Let's underpromise and overdeliver. I will say, at parts of my life, that has been my theme. When you underpromise, usually you deliver less than if you had overpromised and you stretch yourself. This is the piece people are missing. If you want to thrive and excel, you should overpromise. The delivery will always be more. In the end, what counts is the outcomes. It's not what you promised. Every leader should have an audacious, ambitious goal and try to get people there. So clearly, he set an audacious, ambitious goal, and it's changed the trajectory of our universe right now. But I, I love the way that he really pushed, frankly, my own thinking about this easy mindset um, in terms of how you set goals and how you set expectations. So thank you for indulging me in three stories from three amazing leaders who created the time and space to, to contribute to this conversation. So I'm not alone in answering Janet's text immediately. <laughs> <laughs> when Janet calls, 
all the leaders came running. Um, so I've been, I've had the pleasure of watching um, Janet be our board chair for Bright Pink. And so I've seen a little bit of her leadership style in the nonprofit space. Um, and I'm just totally inspired by it, I have to say. Well, how would you describe your own leadership style and what type of of leaders do you think the world needs now? Mm. Okay, so before big, we do big, that, that's a big question. The since second we talked one's... about Bright Pink, I just do want a quick shout out. Um, so Lindsay Avner, who is right here, can you just do a quick wave, hello. <laughs> so Lindsay Avner is the CEO and founder of Bright Pink, um, not-for-profit focused on young women's breast and ovarian health. Um, we've actually just transformed the organization into venture philanthropy, and so we're entering a new phase instead of delivering services ourselves because we did not feel that a bunch of incredible, um, primarily white women um, from Chicago could deliver services to the underserved community the way we wanted to. So we've transformed into venture philanthropy. Lindsay is an incredible transformational leader um, and has brought us together. So I just want to do that quick shout out of a, a small but important, incredibly important Chicago-based not-for-profit that might not be on your radar. So and that's, how you can pivot with intention. And you can pivot yeah. with huge intention. We did a couple of mm -hmm. years of trying this on our own, and we're like, we are not moving the needle here. We need to do something different. And Lindsay has been an incredible inspiration to me. So anyway, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to do a quick not-for-profit commercial. OK, so back to leadership. Um, I Early in my career, someone shared an analogy with me, which um, I think really articulates best how I think of myself as a leader, and I'll talk about how I've morphed the language around that. The analogy this leader used was, normally people think about you climb up you climb up the hill to the top, and when you are the leader, you are sitting at the top of the mountain or the top of the hill. And the analogy he used, which is absolutely the one I try to live by, is you flip the triangle or the pyramid upside down, and you are standing at the bottom holding everybody else up. And that is, I believe, and I think my team, a few of them are here, would say that that is how I've tried to live as a leader, full stop. The language that I use today, because that's a little bit of a clumsy analogy, but I wanted to share the backstory since you asked the question, is I deeply believe that my job as a leader is to make everyone around me as wildly successful as possible. And that is really my only job. And what I tell my teams and this broad team, you know, Deloitte's a big place. I could be running around with my hair on fire, a client issue, a staff issue, something in the media. I have to ground myself and remind myself that my only job is to create an environment where everyone in our organization can be as wildly successful personally and professionally as possible. And that's, that's, that's sort of the sum and the heart of the matter for me and how I think about leadership. And I try to filter out all the rest of the noise and think about every decision I'm making and every amount of time that I'm investing in, the million topics, is it about creating an environment where my teams can be successful? Now, we're in professional services, so we, of course, have the goal of making our clients wildly successful. That is the heart of the matter of professional services organizations. But if my team doesn't feel like they can do that brilliantly well, then the client, there's no client conversation to be had. So that's, that's the heart of, of, of how I think about leadership and what I think matters. I think the climate that we're in today, I think that was, I feel incredibly lucky to have evolved my leadership style to this place because I do believe in this very topsy-turvy world we're living in with you know, the, the future of work looking so unpredictable and different and the talent challenges that we face that are certainly very different than many chapters of my career, and frankly, the complexity of issues that are coming at each of us every day that none of us could have imagined being the issues we were faced. I feel incredibly lucky to have developed that as a core tenet of how I lead, because I do believe authenticity and having your teams know that you'll walk over glass for them um, and that you're going to create an environment for them to thrive um, is, is are incredibly important attributes in this moment. Um, you know, going off of that a little bit, you, you kind of answered it already, but I'm just curious to dig into that a little bit more since I'm really kind of obsessed with this issue with how we're all dealing with unprecedented things and we kept said unprecedented so many times it became like a, a meaningless word. Um, <laughs> but it's still but, the right word. That's the problem. I'm annoyed about that. There is no other, I don't know what the synonym, synonym is. Um, 
regarding you, you work with so many huge companies and so many high profile leaders and not so high profile leaders. What do you think the world needs now? What are we, what are, what are the kind of people that we want to rise up in our own companies and support and push them to, to, to be leaders? So I think we need to create the space for leaders who are empathetic. I think we need to create the space for leaders who understand that the complexity of the problems that any of us face can't be solved alone. You know, I, I we did some research a couple of years ago within Deloitte around the evolution of the C-suite. And C-suite 1.0, think about the 60s and 70s, which was incredibly hierarchical. And whether it was an office, it, just think about the Chicago office. Um, the head of the Chicago office was the king of the castle. I would say king or queen, but it was mostly men at that point, so I can say king. Were king of the castle and called all the shots. And they were all knowing. C-suite 2.0 was all about functional domains. And I mean, I used to laugh. I used to think about how many CTO roles are there? There's a chief technology officer, there's a chief talent officer, the chief tax officer, right? So it's all about functional domains. Today, C-suite 3.0 is how do you actually work across all of those disciplines and domains? Because the level of complexity of issue and topic is well beyond what any of us could even begin to think about solving on our own. So that's one dimension, Tara. And then the other, I would say, is understanding that the future of talent and the future of work, um, we still don't know exactly how that movie is going to be written. And just quick, to tie it back to the conversation around women, just quick survey that we did. Women are you know, unprecedentedly, oh god, I use that word too, <laughs> record levels of stress and tension and mental health. Coming out of the survey we just did, but the stat that stuck with me the most is that 96% of the women surveyed, and it was professional women surveyed, so that they, if they believed that they would, could, they wanted to ask for flexibility in their work, that they would not get their next promotion. 96%. And so that to me sort of puts this in sort of the bullseye, the center of the bullseye, what as leaders we need to do is figure out what the future is going to look like where we can create the space for a very different kind of workforce and very different environment. So those are sort of the two trends that I'm seeing that I think sort of sit at the heart of the matter for what the future is going to look like for executives and leadership. Yeah, I think, I don't know if I'm going to get this right, but something like 5 million women left the workplace or something like that. And so that's kind of leads into my next question are, what do you see and what, what are your challenges for the, all the companies that you work for and advise? What are the challenges and risks and, and how can we support opportunities for women? Yeah, so 5 million women left. We're still down a million from pre-pandemic, still down a million. So all the progress we've made, we are still set back. And I do think, uh, I do think Tara, it bridges into how we create, how we create the businesses of the future that will have both the flexibility that women and men need, by the way, we've been talking about women, but women and men need, and the kind of environment where women feel like they can contribute in a meaningful way, advance their career, be intellectually challenged, um, and create the kind of life that they want to create. I think that's really at the heart of the matter. And I am at my heart an optimist, and the statistics are not great. So I will absolutely admit that my optimism defies gravity a bit. I do believe we have the opportunity with the technologies that we now deeply understand, the fact that we've lived in each other's living rooms over the last couple of years, I really deeply believe that we are at a moment where we can change this conversation. We just have to be really thoughtful and disciplined about doing it and not lose the, the silver lining goodness that's come out of this very difficult time over the last few years and that we've showed and created we can work in really, really different ways. Yeah, I support that wholeheartedly. I think we have to hold each other accountable in, in, in every, everywhere we are in, in work. Um, I've got one more question before we go to um, all the questions that, that you all have submitted. So there's a chapter in the book about committing to the work of the inclusive leader. And that's another big buzzword that we hear a lot about and maybe people talk about and don't, aren't actually living um, and, and having a live ex lived experience. But many companies, including Deloitte, are aiming to make meaningful changes in this space. And I know that Deloitte just launched your DEI Institute as well as Conve 
convened the recent CDEIO forum. So how's that for a title? I know, C -D -E -I, -O. C -D -E I O. I got that right. Um, <laughs> e -I -E -I I'd love for you to talk about the importance of this diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what leaders need to keep in mind to hold each other accountable, hold themselves accountable to advance progress. So we've talked about a lot of things today, but accountability, and I have not talked about accountability as one of my core values, and certainly both my teams within Deloitte and my clients would tell you that that sort of sits, sits deeply at my core. So I wanna talk about um, actually our transparency report. So we decided as an organization about two and a half years ago to create a transparency report, and this was a really, really big moment for us. We, we had absolutely led, you know, our women's initiative back in the 90s um, was, was groundbreaking and we felt that we were absolutely leaders in the marketplace on all things diversity and then diversity and inclusion and then we added equity into the conversation. But the reality is it was actually very um, um, scary and humbling to put out in public for all of our people, by the way, as well as our clients, people we wanted to come work with us, our competitors, the universe, very, very detailed statistics about where we were on that journey. And I will tell you, as a business leader, I couldn't get my hands on that data five years ago because it was all locked up. I love the lawyers in the room and my, our general counsel is one of my dearest friends, but I couldn't even get my hands on that data um, as a business leader and we were gonna put that out for the world to see. And there are two things we've really learned from that journey that are, I think, so important. One is the disaggregation of the data. And you know, I'm a quant by background, so it's in my DNA, but you have to really, really unpack the data within your organization. Set goals, you know, we talked about Albert, Albert Borla challenged us to set lofty goals, set goals, and of course, measure yourself against those. But you can only do that if you've really disaggregated the data. And I'll just, simple example that we use in our organization is not just, I'll, I'll use gender diversity, but gender diversity as it relates to leaders um, in, in P&L roles. So we track and report very clearly on that as an example of disaggregating our data. Other disaggregations are taking race at a much, much, much deeper level, taking ethnicity at a much deeper level. Um, so we've disaggregated our data 19 ways to Sunday, and that has created a level of intentionality and discipline that I believe is critical. The second is around really being introspective about your own orthodoxies within your organization. And that has probably been, disaggregating data is stressful and scary. Breaking orthodoxies is really, really, really hard. I'll just share in full sort of transparency and authenticity, uh, one that we've had to break as an organization. And I've lived this deeply in my sort of soul is that we're an unbiased meritocracy. And that was at the heart of how Deloitte carried itself. If you showed up, if you, you were hired into our organization it was a level playing field. And what we've come to learn and appreciate and study and understand is that actually is not true. People come with very different lived experiences, different backgrounds, different pedigrees, and we've really worked to try to break apart every dimension of from recruiting to onboarding to staffing to development to promotion to make sure we understand how we can have a level pay playing field because without it, Diversity and inclusion are essentially irrelevant because equity sits at the core and that's sort of at the heart of the matter. So that's been very, very difficult and challenging journey for us, um, but one I'm incredibly proud of and it's we're still a work in progress. Part of that message, and maybe I'll leave on this theme, is also making sure that we're super clear that by changing the, the manner with which we think about these orthodoxies actually creates more opportunity for everybody. And it is not a, limit, it is not a limiter for the organization. Um, and we've, um, we're continuing to be on that education journey as an organization in holding ourselves accountable internally for how we carry ourselves and externally for how we report on our data. Yeah, I followed that um, when, when Deloitte was doing that. And I thought it was very brave I, I thought it was very brave. I mean, I was like, wow, they are really doing it because you have to now. Um, and also, it makes people uncomfortable, you know, and that's what we're living through and you just got to be uncomfortable. Um, I was actually just on a call with a major financial institute that was talking about pay equity. 
and they wanted to advertise on our network about pay equity, and I'm, text, I'm texting um, my ad sales exec going, do they have pay equity? <laughs> <laughs> because we're not gonna put this, you know, Oprah's name behind it if they don't have pay equity themselves, and have they looked at their pay equity? Yeah. So anyway, it's a well, very, just, that's another, that's a whole nother show. Well, and just, <laughs> just quick one liner, our first transparency report did not talk about pay equity. Our people and the market called us out on it very overtly. Um, our second report, which just released maybe a month or so ago, um, has actually some very deep and thoughtful data in around pay equity um, and transparency around pay. So we're on that journey as well. Yes. Um, so here's a, a great question, which I love because we've all faced this so many times um, in the workplace. Janet, how have you managed yourself when working with a difficult person or situation? <laughs> um, I love that question. Um, one of my core tenets of leadership um, is, which has come to me um, not naturally as a 20-something, I don't think I really understood this, but it's become really important to me, is a mantra that I use, which is to assume and expect positive intent. And that is something that I will tell you has absolutely changed my frame of reference of how I deal with difficult people because I have sort of deeply embedded in how I think about, how I think about whoever I'm negotiating with, dealing with, um, in hard conversation with, is try to think about the fact that they're coming to this conversation um, with the intent of a positive outcome and expecting me to have positive intent. Now, are they always? No, but that mindset Unless it's my fiercest competitor, in which case, and by the way, in this universe, our competitors are often our collaborators, but unless they're fiercest competitor in competition, that has really helped me as a grounding principle to, um, to, to, to deal with really difficult people. The second thing that I do, I'm a, I'm a practice, 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 prepare, prepare, prepare person. And if I'm going into a conversation with someone that I find unpleasant or difficult to deal with, I, I'm pretty disciplined about over-preparing for that conversation, testing ideas with people on my team about how I think it's going to go, and they push me and challenge me. So those two things are sort of my yin and yang of, of how I do that. I think that's, I love that. And by the way, it's still really, really, really hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I love this question too. Um, many of us want to feel as though there is real purpose behind the work we do and think about the legacy we leave behind as leaders purpose i just love it what advice would you leave this room with on how to achieve impact what a great question um so um margaret wherever she's floating around um, and tara uh, recommended a, a, a really amazing book to me um, recently called From Strength to Strength. Did I get that right? Yep. By Albert Brooks. Yep. Um, so Arthur Brooks. Arthur Everyone Brooks. says Albert Brooks. People oh my. my age say Albert Brooks. It's Arthur Brooks. <laughs> Albert Arthur Brooks, Brooks is the author or the comedian. Yeah, totally <laughs> different person. Um, so he, um, I found it to be an incredibly impactful book for thinking about um, my life and how I think about purpose. And he really challenges you to think about the decisions that you make um, and whether those are personal decisions or decisions th for your organization, not just through the lens of who you are and what you want to accomplish, but the impact that, that those decisions will have. And so for me, and I've read it recently, and it's I've gone back and I've looked at decisions I've made historically, and I've thought, hmm, I, I, that probably did not hit the mark of the broader agenda or objective. And sometimes you make short-term decisions, but anytime you're thinking about a long-term decision, um, his book has really helped me reframe both how I spend my time and how I think about my everyday decisions in a very, very, very different way. So I put that on the definitely recommend um, book list. I'll try to get the author name imprinted in my brain. Um, and he's a very sought after speaker, um, but if you can hear him speak live, it is really incredible. Um, and it's really pushed my thinking um, in, and around, in and around that topic. Yeah, for everybody who's interested in him, he also writes the column, How to Build a Life in the Atlantic. It it's a really excellent column for anybody wanting to build a life. Um, I will tell you, my pandemic discovery <laughs> run reading has been The Atlantic, which yeah. has some of the most thoughtful and challenging 
um, writing, balanced, thoughtful, and challenging writing is sort of my go-to if I want to get deep and thoughtful on something, and he's, he's a great contributor there. Yeah. So um, we're, on, we're um, off to our, our wrap. I guess we're wrapping now. Um, but I have one more question for Janet. Um, and it's really appropriate, I think, that we're in, the, we're in the Writers Museum because this question actually comes from Gene Siskel, the famous Chicago writer who was a film critic and then had that show that many of us grew up watching. Um, and it's a question that Gene Siskel asked Oprah once, and it stumped her, which is very difficult to do. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> So I don't know if she's ever been stumped besides this one, but um, in terms of women in leadership and arriving and thriving, Janet, what do you know for sure? Good question. What I know for sure is that nothing hard is ever done alone. So I talk a lot about women I want women to know that you're not in it alone, and it's one of the reasons we wrote this book, is so that women would know they're not in it alone, because it can feel lonely sometimes, or hard, or like no one ever has been through it before. But extending that to know that nothing difficult is ever done alone, and we're in it together. Amen. Agreed. Love it. Thank you so much, Janet. Tara, thank you. <laughs> I told you you're in for a real treat, right? This was just <laughs> incredible. Um, what a way to kick off the season. So inspiring. Thank you all for being here. I think you've noticed that Janet is giving you all her book, and there's a little note in there. So thank you for giving the book to everybody. Nice. I made the joke when I heard about this that during the pandemic, some people um, worked on their sourdough starter. Janet wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I missed one member of our Council of Advisors who is here, and that's Mary Cook of Salo. So I just wanted to acknowledge her, too. Thank you for being here. Um, so before we wrap, I just want to uh, talk about our next program, which is going to be here again. Mm -hmm. We have Andy Dunn, who's the founding CEO of Bonobos, mm -hmm. who's telling the story of burn rate. Um, on entrepreneurship and mental health. And during this conversation, he's going to be talking with Jasmine Shells, who's um, a great Chicago entrepreneur. Her company, Five to Nine, is, is growing like crazy. Definitely you know, keep an eye on them. And they're gonna explore the intersection of mental illness and entrepreneurship. So we hope to see you back here. And um, we really hope you stick around. We have some lovely refreshments. Uh, there's a reception. And so please stay, connect with each other, uh, talk with Janet, talk with each other and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks.